What is SRE? Hi, I'm Tammy Buter and I'm a Principal SRE at Gremlin. Today we're going to talk about what is SRE, the SRE phases, SRE use cases and SRE success stories. So what is SRE? Well, Site Reliability Engineering, SRE, is a software engineering strategy and methodology. The term SRE was coined by Ben Trainer from Google in 2003, a pretty long time ago. Site Reliability Engineering involves both ops work, tickets, on-call, manual tasks, and development work, internal tooling, SRE tools, and building automatic systems. The percentage of time spent on ops and development work depends on the needs of your organization. It's an important metric to track. Over time, the ops percentage for each system should decrease. Our work is like being a part of the world's most intense pit crew. We change the tires of a race car as it's going 100 miles per hour. Pretty fast. This is from Andrew Widdowson, who's an SRE at Google. So let's look at a day in the life of an SRE. Say you start with this balance. You're spending 50% of your time on ops work for your service, say, for example, the databases, and 50% of time on development, which involves building autom automation, doing internal tooling, trying to create other types of software that will help other teams learn more about your databases and their reliability or their operations work. And then you're able to actually say, look at another team. Or it might look like this. You might be spending 80% of your time on ops work and you're only able to spend 20% of your time on dev work. So this could be that you have a lot of manual work to do, a lot of incidents, maybe you've got you know, hundreds of incidents a week that you're resolving just flat out on call, getting paged at all hours of the night, and you only really have a tiny bit of time to automate tasks that just annoy you. Not very good, but you can get it to be much better. Or it might look like this. You might, say, be able to improve it and get your ops percentage down to 25% and then be spending 50% of your time on dev work. So we see here we still have another 25% that we could do something else with. We could obviously do more development work or we could look at what else we could do, maybe outside of our own team. So we have this 25% where we could say, this is time I can potentially share with another team, not the databases team. I could share my SRE skills and go and help out, say, the monitoring team, or for example, the build team or the internal dev tools team. So now let's look at SRE phases. We start at plan, then code, then build and test, over to deploy, operate, productionize, and monitor. In the middle, we have integration. There are a lot of different tools that SREs commonly use. In plan, there's tools like Git, Jira, Google Docs for figuring out what we're going to create. Same thing in code. Then we have build tools that we commonly use as well, Gradle, Maven. And then in test, we can do some chaos engineering tests with Gremlin, for example. Then we can go over to deploy and deploy and operate actually has a lot of different tools that we can use. There's a lot of tools created in the industry to help with this particular phase. Chef, Gremlin again, AWS, Kubernetes, PagerDuty. Then we want to productionize our software. This is where we actually are doing testing in production, making sure that what we have in production works as expected. Here we might be using software like Fire Hydrant, Fire Hydrant for incident management, Gremlin as well for your chaos engineering in production. And then we move on to monitor. Here we might be using something like Dynatrace, which is pretty common in enterprise, Datadog, also very popular, and Gremlin, very popular too, to help you make sure that your monitoring works as expected. So now let's look at SRE use cases. 
you can actually use um, this pyramid here to determine where you're going to focus your time and what you need to do first. Usually we'll say that the SRE pyramid looks like this. This actually comes from Google. So the bottom is monitoring. Next up is incident response then post-mortem analysis, which is what happens after you have an incident. You write a post-mortem and you analyze the incident. Testing and release procedures, capacity planning, development, and then product. But let's dig into a few specific areas today. So we're going to start with one, incident response. Then we're going to look at post-mortem analysis. So SRE use case one, incident response. This is a common timeline for what might happen during incident response. We start at detection, then move to diagnosis, then mitigation, then prevention, then back to closure, then detection again. We have a few different roles and responsibilities. So let's start looking from the left-hand side. Under detection, we have, we alert and page for the SEV or the high severity incident. We then discover the source of the SEV, could have multiple things occurring, could be a cascading failure. And we measure this as time to detection. Then we do mitigation. This is where we put in our Band-Aid fix or stop the bleeding. We introduce a fix and we mitigate the impact of the set. We try and go really fast. This is TTR, time to recovery. Then we move on to prevention. We try and understand the root cause or causes and we complete all SEV action items. What might be a root cause as an example? An incident that I've previously worked on happened every Tuesday night where a batch job would hammer the database and actually cause incidents. The same batch job every Tuesday at the same time. That was the root cause. Why was the batch job there? Somebody had created it many years ago. Nobody knew where it was coming from and that person had left the company. So there are a lot of things that we need to dig into there to be able to make sure that that doesn't ever happen again um, and obviously it's quite complicated. That's why we do a post-mortem. And we make sure that we actually complete all high priority SEV action items. I recommend doing it within one month. Next, we have closure. This is where we run a game day to, game day to replicate the SEV and confirm a fix is reliable. We measure both of these, prevention and closure, as time to detection. Next up, we have detection again. This is to check, does this exact incident ever happen again? We really want to track that and we want to measure that as TBF, time between failures. When we look at this entire timeline, it's called total time of impact, TTI. The two roles and responsibilities that we need are one, incident manager on call, the IMOC. I was previously IMOC at Dropbox for several years. This is where you're responsible for the biggest incidents across the company. You lead and coordinate the entire SEV team through the SEV life cycle. We also had another role that I recommend, tech lead on call. The tech lead settles in the trenches and stays laser focused on technical problem solving. The only person who can talk to the tech, tech lead is actually the IMOC. The other role we have is the technical lead on call. The T-lock settles in the trenches and stays laser focused on technical problem solving. The only person who can communicate with the T-lock is the IMOC. Now let's look at use case number two, post-mortem analysis. Here's a post-mortem, SEV0 slow walrus. I recommend giving SEVs real names because it's easier to remember them. And then if it happens again, you'll say, I think it's another slow walrus. We label the IMOC, the TLOC. We say if the postmortem is a final or a draft, we add the incident date, the published date. Then we have an executive summary, which includes the impact and the root causes. Then we want to have the problem summary, duration of the problem, products affected, percentage of the product affected, user impact, revenue impact, detection, resolution, root causes and trigger, then a full timeline of all recovery efforts, including timestamps and what happened, who did what. Then lessons learned, what went well, what went poorly, 
outage, recovery, where did we get lucky? And then we need to have the action items. I recommend one to five, no more than 10, that you need to complete within the next month. You really need to prioritize these and follow up to make sure they get done. That's super important. Come to consensus before the post-mortem meeting finishes and determine what you're going to do, who's going to do it, and make sure that they can commit to doing it within the next month. Glossary and appendix, that's it. So now, this is what happens with our postmortems. We take our postmortems, we collect them all up, we then put them in a postmortem database. For example, you could use Fire Hydrant, or sometimes people use Jira. Then we want to move them to our postmortem analysis dashboard. You can either build these yourself, or you can use an out-of-the-box solution. Now let's look at SRE use case number three, incident reproduction. Here what we do is we take the postmortem, we then create a gremlin scenario, and we actually reproduce the incident using gremlin. So we run that incident again after we've completed those top priority action items and make sure that if this incident did happen again, we wouldn't have a severity incident. We wouldn't have a high severity incident. We wouldn't be impacted again. We wouldn't be having troubles. Um, the customers wouldn't be experiencing failure. We would actually be able to gracefully degrade. We would be able to handle the issue if it happened again. So this is where we write up our incident reproduction results, and then we actually automate it. So we don't just run this once and say, yep, we're all good now. We actually trigger this incident to happen again. For example, say if you had a DNS failure, what you can do is you can put in the fixes, make sure that you can actually fail over DNS, then use Gremlin to trigger DNS not working. You can actually do that as a DNS scenario in Gremlin. Then what you want to do is write up your results and then automate it so you actually trigger DNS to fail every week and you make sure that you're able to handle it. That's awesome, especially in a situation where a lot of people are not trained on how to handle DNS failure when it just happens out of the blue. It's going to happen every week at, say, 10 a.m. and everyone's going to be okay about it because they'll know that it's coming every Wednesday. Now let's talk about SRE success stories. I used to work at Dropbox in the past, and I actually shared some of the success stories that we had in this talk. You can check it out. Site reliability engineering at Dropbox. There are a lot of different things that I did myself to get a really great result. Like for example, I got a 10X reduction in incidents in three months by doing high priority chaos engineering experiments every week, three times a week. That's quite a lot, but it got me a 10X reduction in incidents, which was awesome and I would definitely do that again if I needed to. But I didn't need to. Following those three months, I actually had a reduction in high severity incidents, so we had no more SEV zeros, which we used to have them pretty frequently. We had no more for 12 months following that, and then I went and did some other things. So we had a 10X reduction in incidents in three months, no SEV zeros for 12 plus months following that, and we also had an increase in team engagement because obviously people are more happy when they don't have to get paged in the middle of the night and your team can remain at a good size. You don't have to continuously onboard new people and train them up because you just have so much manual ops work to do. We also had a reduction in on-call time, which was awesome too. We've also had a lot of success at Gremlin with doing SRE work. So here's our 2019 Gremlin Game Days roadmap, which we plotted out a full roadmap for all the game days we wanted to run in 2019. We then also wrote up blog posts to showcase the work that we've done. For example, here is one on the right, inside Gremlin, staging, monitoring, and alerting game day. So we have regular monthly game days, identification of 10 plus critical issues, increase in team knowledge, reduction in on-call training time, and everyone's actually super excited to come along and watch a game day because they love learning about it and it's really interesting and it's really useful. It's a great use of company time. What can you do next? Join the community. Go to gremlin.com slash slack to meet other SREs who are working on all sorts of interesting problems. The best way to learn is to learn together. Thank you very much. You can find me by email, tammy at gremlin.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn. Let's connect. Thank you. Bye.